Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Jan Kane from the All Board, and I'm pleased today to introduce Jameson Robart. Jameson is the uh, Neuroscience Service Specialist and Stroke Coordinator at the hospital in Alpena, but also in some other hospitals. That is his specialty. So maybe he'll, he can tell us a little bit more about his role. Um, he's a registered nurse that graduated initially from ACC and then Ann Arbor, U of M. And he also um, used to work in the emergency rooms where he saw a lot of strokes. So he's getting it from different points. I just wanted to tell you, if you're interested in this, in health-related topics, next month, November, I believe, 17, the new president of the hospital will be here to do a program, not so much on health, but on the hospital and what's happening with the hospital and plans for the future and changes and things like that. So watch for that. You might be interested in that. So, Jameson. All right. Audio sound good? All right. I'd like to thank you all for having me today. Um, thank you, Jan, again, for inviting me here. It's always nice to be able to speak on, uh, on behalf of the hospital and in the community as well. Um, as Jan explained, I, I am a uh, registered nurse, um, critical care emergency room prior to uh, this position, which takes me from Alpena to Gladwin to Midland to uh, West Branch, kind of all all over the uh, central and uh, northern and eastern regions of the state. So I do get to deal with a lot of stroke. I have a lot of partnerships with EMS agencies that I kind of work with as well. Uh, and today we're gonna do sort of a brief uh, overview of stroke, the different types of stroke, uh, warning signs, as well as um, kind of how to alert, you know, obviously 911 we know is, is, our, is how we activate our emergency response systems in, in the uh, counties here. So we want to make sure that we utilize them, especially if we uh, are, are seeing symptoms of stroke or signs of stroke. Uh, so to begin today, next slide, obviously our objectives for today are how to define stroke, um, recognizing the signs and symptoms of stroke, um, obviously the importance of activating EMS, as I just explained, and knowing your risk factors. And if at any point in time, if anybody has any questions, feel free. I don't mind if you want to interrupt. I don't mind if you need to get up and use the bathroom or anything like that. You won't, you won't offend me. So, um, so we'll kind of get, get rolling on this. Um, right now, uh, the two charts or two graphs that I actually have displayed on the screen here. So this is uh, the first one is, is 2021 data from Alpena. So these are the communities and the uh, counties that we actually serve. Um, and my Michigan as a whole, you can see we're, we're spread out. We, we deal and care for a lot of strokes. And we, we really, uh, our goal is to be on the forefront of stroke care for the patients uh, and in our communities that we serve. Uh, so we have a, a large a large variety of uh, stroke patients, TIAs, hemorrhagic strokes, and acute ischemic strokes, all of which I will kind of talk a little bit more in detail in a little while here. So stroke facts, there's a, there's a number of them for you here, but um, stroke is actually the fifth leading cause of death in the US. 87% of all strokes are ischemic. Um, again, like I said, I'll kind of go into uh, the difference, uh, different types of strokes in a minute. 20% uh, of those strokes are actually called transient ischemic attacks or TIAs. Uh, without workup, those are what we call the big bad strokes, all right? So those are the ones that, you know, um, maybe symptoms occur and then they go away, or maybe we decide that we want to go to sleep at night and we'll wake up in the morning and see if everything's better, all right? So, so those, those TIAs, obviously, without workup can go on to be a major stroke in the future. So we definitely want to have those uh, diagnosed and, and get a workup and treatment done on those. Um, approximately 800,000 strokes actually will occur uh, this year in the U.S., uh, one stroke every 40 seconds. Uh, one in four women will have a stroke in their lifetime. And two-thirds of those survivors will actually be affected by a long-term disability. Uh, stroke is the leading cause of serious long-term disability in adults. And teen and young adults are up 50% in the last 10 years. 25% uh, of strokes are recurrent. So it's, it's not uncommon for us to see a stroke come into our emergency room, that patient be discharged on appropriate you know, medications and management, and then that individual actually return. 
Um, sometimes it can be, hey, I, I missed doses of my medication or I just uh, didn't follow through with my, my, my primary care provider. Um, so we always encourage routine checkups and everything else. And in that book that I actually handed out or the folder that I handed out, there's kind of a nifty little card that I included. It's really good for a purse or for a wallet. Um, it actually includes like obviously your date of your checkup. It allows you to continue to uh, maintain, here's my target weight or where my weight is currently. Um, it also keeps track of your cholesterol. So high cholesterol is leading cause of, you know, as well as high blood pressure is the leading cause of strokes in, in a lot of our patients and uh, obviously blood pressure management. So on the back of that card as well, I'll go through symptoms and stuff, but there are some symptoms, just symptom reminders on that card too. So it's a good catch all card. All right. So what is a stroke? A stroke is actually a brain attack. So it occurs when there is a, a blood flow to a part of the brain is, is blocked or ceases and stops. Um, and it usually is due to a blocked or a burst vessel. Uh, when that blood flow stops, that means oxygen that's delivered to that part of the body or the brain actually stops as well. And it, it actually forms what we call a infarct. Um, so that infarct will grow in size until we either dissolve that clot through medication or we extract that clot through almost a mechan mechanical uh, intervention. Um, so again, we want to make sure that really quickly we reestablish that blood flow to that brain. Um, depending on where it is in the brain, it can cause various deficits. So it can cause uh, balance issues, walking issues. It can cause memory issues. Um, it can cause visual issues. Um, it all depends on where that, um, that blockage occurs in the brain. I always like to kind of educate nurses on this and providers. Um, it kind of puts everything into perspective when you start thinking about strokes specifically. So every minute counts when we're treating strokes. So that's why we always explain to people do not go back to sleep. You know, don't sleep it off. It's it's more important to get it checked out. If it's nothing, it's nothing. But you know, it could be um, a precursor to something um, something bigger. Uh, so obviously, every second, um, there's 32,000 neurons that are actually lost. Uh, that actually equates to about 8.7 hours of uh, brain aging. Uh, then when we look at every minute, you're looking at about 1.9 million neurons. Uh, which equates to about 3.1 weeks of brain aging. And then every hour is about 120 million neurons, which equates to 3.6 years. So quick treatment is the most important thing for stroke because that can ultimately lead to long-term disability and, um, and, and affect your ability to, to uh, complete your daily living functions and chores at home and cooking dinner and, and, and being able to go out and, and care for yourself and, and come to presentations like this and listen to me talk to you, right? So, so the first up, as I said, we're gonna go through three types of stroke. There is a, a couple subtypes in one of these categories, but the very first one you heard me mention was a transient ischemic attack. So it's a TIA. Again, that, that occurs when a plaque, um, you probably have heard a lot about plaques, right? So arteries over time, we think of them kind of like a hose, right? When you kink that hose off, you know, your blood pressure can kind of go up a little bit as well as you can see in that picture on, on, the, uh, on the right of the screen there, that yellow coloration is actually a plaque buildup in that artery. So sometimes, you know, when those plaques can cause reduced blood flow and sometimes they can actually break off um, and that plaque can actually move up into the brain and it can actually cause uh, a, the blockage. So symptoms are almost identical to stroke. As I said, these are precursors to larger strokes. What happens in a TIA is those symptoms uh, can last from a minute all the way up to 24 hours. Uh, TIAs, as I said, are precursors to severe strokes and they should not be ignored. We should seek medical uh, attention immediately. So obviously when you're, when you're looking at these, these are your, your arteries, right? They run up through your neck, up into your brain, and they supply your brain with oxygen. So when that plaque ruptures, depending on where it is in the artery, it can go up to a specific spot in the brain and it can lodge in one of these vessels. At that point in time where it lodges, it can actually cause a period of, um, of, of low oxygen perfusion to that part of the brain, which we call an infarct. And that infarct over time until that blockage actually ruptures or dissolves, 
it will actually continue to grow, all right? Just because you're not receiving brain to that part of the tissue, and so over time, it can actually cause, um, cause brain death. All right. Doesn't look like the, they're going to work on the other ones, but I will continue to move forward. So an ischemic stroke, much like a TIA, again, it is a brain attack. Um, that occurs, again, like I said, when that blood flow actually ceases. So the blood flow that's bringing from the heart, it's bringing oxygen to the tissues, it suddenly stops due to that blockage. And rather than a TIA where that blockage might dissolve on its own in the area of the brain might reperfuse with oxygen, that's, that stays there, all right? In that case, in an ischemic stroke, we need to treat that immediately, all right? Um, when that blood flow stops again, oxygen's unable to circulate to that area of the brain. It can cause death to that um, part of the brain, and that's permanent. So there's no reverse, reversing that. Once it, once it causes the death, there's no re uh, reversing that. Um, high blood pressure is actually the leading risk factor for ischemic strokes. And the last one that I'll talk about is an actual hemorrhagic stroke. And there's two subtypes. Um, this occurs when an actual blood vessel ruptures near the brain. On the very first one, we're looking at an intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, an intracerebral hemorrhage occurs when that blood vessel ruptures deep within the brain. So rather than being on this outside surface, it's further into, into the brain. Um, and a subarachnoid hemorrhage is the second subtype. So that actually occurs when an aneurysm um, on or near the brain surface ruptures and it leaks into the space between the brain and the skull. So you'll notice this dura and then the skull. Obviously your skull is a hard casing and in between that is kind of like a very thin layer that kind of protects the brain if it gets jostled. Um, that's where a subarachnoid hemorrhage, if you, if you hear that, that might occur. So we like to teach warning signs. We teach this to EMS, we teach it to nurses, providers. All these things are part of our assessments in the hospital uh, when a patient actually comes in. But uh, this is also stuff that we, we like to teach the community. If you see something, even on those cards, like I said, if you walk away from uh, this, this presentation with one thing today, it would be to remember this mnemonic, all right? Uh, so the mnemonic actually stands for, it's uh, be fast. The very first part is balance, all right? So does the individual, does yourself or the individual that you're, you're seeing that may be affected by a stroke, do they seem to have some sort of loss of balance and coordination? Uh, the next would be eyes. So has the person actually lost vision in one or both eyes? Uh, we, we like to say, is the vision blurry? If for some reason the vision, um, we call it a visual field cut. So maybe you can only see out of a part of the eye, all right? Um, that would be cause for concern. That could be something uh, affecting um, around the eye or the blood vessels that actually lead up to the eye uh, that we'd like to obviously investigate further. Uh, face. So does the person's face look uneven? Is there any difference in when you saw them the day ago to today? Um, we often ask people to smile for us. If for some reason they smile and one side of the face continues to droop and the other side goes up, there might be, a, there might be some facial paralysis or numbness or something going on in the face that, that obviously, like I said, we would like to investigate that further. Uh, arms. This is uh, something that providers do when a patient comes into the emergency room, and you can easily do this in the field as well. Um, we want people to be careful if they have a rotator cuff surgery or if their shoulders are, are bad. We want to make sure, um, be careful if, if you're assessing. The number one thing, obviously, is we want to call 911, but a quick assessment might lead you to, uh, um, to identifying that, hey, this might be a potential stroke. So we'll say arms. So we'll actually have uh, an individual hold their arms out in front of them. Does one drop down? Does one drop down really quickly? Can they even lift their arm up? Um, oftentimes with stroke, you'll see it's uh, unilateral, meaning it, it um, on one side of the body is affected and the other side is not affected. Uh, speech, that's probably one of the most familiar ones for people other than the facial drooping piece. Is that person's speech slurred? Is they, uh, do they have trouble speaking in general um, off of their baseline? Um, and do they seem confused? Do they know where they are? Is it, um, a lot of times we'll, we will deal with patients that may have uh, a baseline confusion, 
but is this confusion out of the norm of what they're, they're usually at? Um, and the very last part is time. Again, call 911 immediately. Our EMS services are really good and we try to work very, very closely with them. Um, meaning we walk through assessments with them. We will, um, we will kind of teach them how to triage in the field if uh, a patient may be having a stroke to kind of, that way they can alert us quicker and that way we can have all the, all the pieces to the puzzle lined up for when that patient comes in the door. So be fast is a very important warning sign. Again, don't drive, don't, don't wait, don't drive, dial 911. As I said, EMS and paramedics can start testing this actually in the field. Uh, so, so they can get a hold of us, we call it pre-arrival. So they'll actually notify us of a patient's blood pressure, uh, patient's uh, glucose. So sometimes a stroke can mimic what uh, hypoglycemia is, so a low blood sugar. Um, sometimes a confusion, slurred speech, we can rule those things out just by testing a blood sugar real quick. And uh, lastly, like I said, they can, they can kind of notify us early. Uh, My Michigan, our hospital system is really on, um, is attempting to be on the forefront of stroke care for our patients. Uh, we have a lot of really neat high tech uh, gadgets that we utilize to identify stroke. We have a, a system that when we place a patient into a CT scanner, we can get almost immediate results notifying us whether or not there's a hemorrhage or whether or not there is a, a blockage somewhere in the, in the patient's brain. Um, and that just allows us to mobilize quickly to get a, get a medication fast to that patient. As I said, um, uh, ischemic strokes, so that's where that blockage is stuck and it's not moving. Uh, we utilize, we say time is brain, so we utilize a clot-busting medication called IVTPA. Um, it's also known as Altaplase. Uh, it actually is only good for up to 4.5 hours. So when we ask somebody, you know, when did you last see your family member normal? Um, that means when did you last see them before these symptoms started occurring? If it was before 4.5 hours, sometimes people wake up in the morning, they have a cup of coffee and they're sitting at the table together, and then they notice, well, your face, you know, the face is start, kind of starting to droop. Their speech is slurred a little bit more. Um, Obviously, if they're in a 4.5 hour window, we can treat them with that clot busting medication. We can break that clot up and reperfuse that area of the brain. Uh, we don't go over 4.5 hours. Typically, there are some cases that we do, but as the brain ages and as our vessels age, we tend to lose elasticity of our, they, they become a little bit more rigid. They're not as pliable anymore. Um, that could lead to um, a, a hemorrhage in the brain. So there's always risks with the medication, but risks with giving this outweigh benefits on most occasions, 95, 98% of the occasions, it, it's worth delivering that TPA medication. Um, we also offer mechanical thrombectomy. So what happens is we utilize a little guide wire. It's a real, real thin wire, very, very hard to see. Sometimes we enter into the groin or, or um, into an artery and we go up into the brain and we actually extract that clot if it's in an, in an area that we can do that. Um, oftentimes we can do that for clots that are, if, if a patient's last known well, say they go to bed and, and we'll say nine o'clock last night, they wake up and there's something going on and the patient gets into the hospital at eight o'clock in the morning, we're still in that 24 hour window that we can treat that patient but we just need to really scan that brain, figure out where that clot is and see if we can actually initiate a procedure on that patient. So as I said, two, two treatment options, again, IV TPA and mechanical thrombectomy. We always kind of, our discharge education for patients um, after a stroke or a TIA is often to know your risk factors. And we have six that we wanna stop the six. All right, the very first one would be high cholesterol. So again, on that card, you'll notice your HDL and your LDL. Your LDL is always considered your bad cholesterol, right? Um, we normally are able to put patients on what's called uh, uh, atorvastatin or a statin medication. What that does is it actually causes the liver to stop producing that LDL cholesterol. You, you only need a certain amount of that. You don't need over a certain amount of that. So we say when a cholesterol level is over 100, it's good to kind of talk to your provider and they may advise you starting a statin medication. Uh, high blood pressure, 
is another one. So it's a really good way to monitor your blood pressure. Higher blood pressure leads to, again, those hemorrhagic strokes, and it can cause those ischemic strokes. Uh, inactivity, so a sedentary lifestyle. Um, you want to make sure today's a perfect day. If you can bundle up and go outside and get, at least get five minutes of a walk in, that's better than nothing, right? Just get some fresh air and just, just get out for a little bit. Uh, high fat diet. Um, that's something that I'm working on currently because I travel a lot, so I need to start eating a little bit healthier. All right, but that's one thing that we can all kind of trim out a little bit of the a little bit of the high fat diets. Um, uh, diabetes again, that's a it's another big risk factor for a stroke. It just diabetes can cause that plaque buildup again in the arteries, and as I said, those arteries at times um, they can they can break off those plaques can break up and lodge somewhere in the brain. And lastly would be tobacco use. So smoking, again, it causes stiffening of those arteries as well. So when you start looking at a high fat diet, tobacco use and inactivity, high blood pressure, all those things are major precursors to stroke. Those are things that we can actually fix. We also utilize the, uh, the ABC mnemonic. So if you have a, um, a primary care provider, they may suggest that you get on aspirin, uh, just a daily aspirin regimen keeps things thin in the blood, your blood pressure control, cholesterol management, as I said, we kind of talked about a statin. Um, sometimes those are good, but again, those are things that you wanna, you wanna talk to your provider about. You may need it, or they may recommend it, and you may not need it. Um, and again, smoking cessation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. But I stopped that. Mm -hmm. It seems there was something that I read that you don't have to do that anymore, or it's not as recommended. Uh, what, is, what is the situation you're going to have? Is it the baby aspirin? It, it would be. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, so the question was actually um, uh, aspirin where appropriate. Um, the gentleman was explaining that he was taking a baby aspirin for a, a a number of years probably and then over a period of time decided to kind of um stop taking it just because the evidence he was explaining the evidence out may not be oh i'm looking for the word may not be as effective i'll take it yeah i'll take that one yep um so again that's a that's between you and your provider the baby aspirins are the evidence out there, I wouldn't say is um, is is not completely. It's not out that you shouldn't be on an aspirin, but it really is one of those things to where you you would like to consult with your provider prior. Some of them might have a preference of uh, prescribing a patient an aspirin over over others, but but aspirins are good ways to keep that blood and clean it, keep everything in those pipes kind of your blood flowing clean and, and I'm, not, I'm using the wrong word on clean, but um, keeping it thinned, if that makes sense. Um, but any evidence, I don't think that I have any supporting evidence for you one way or another at this point in time. And I am a nurse, I'm not a provider, so I can't make recommendations like that if you, if you catch, what, catch what I mean on that. But I would say definitely consulting with your provider. They're going to have the most up-to-date information, and they'll be able to make those recommendations for you as well. I raised that question with my regular provider, the same thing, and he, he showed me, well, evidence shows this and this and this, and so I considered it, but then I had a point with my cardiologist. I went through the same thing with him, and he said, for me, you should take the aspirin. <laughs> So I think it's something you really need to talk to your doctor about. I don't remember quite the explanation, but I think it was along the lines for younger people that hadn't had stroke experience. It may not, it, there may be more risk than benefit, but later on, there's more benefit than risk. So. And, and as you said, it, it definitely depends on the type of provider. I think you're, you're fine. Most of the cardiologists will definitely recommend that. Um, some of, some of your primary care providers may may say no. Well, it's so. easy not to take and not expensive at all. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. very nice. Yeah, I I don't want to lead you one way or another, but I do take my daily. Okay. So. <laughs> so.
preparation, all right? <laughs> Just in case. We also do um, risk assessments. And unfortunately, the link, the link does work, but I can't get it projected on the screen here. Um, we do do kind of free risk assessments. Again, if you go to our, our homepage, uh, mymichigan.org, and then it's slash stroke. And I do have some brochures actually in the back um, with that, that information on it as well, if you'd like to get in there. Um, and I want to kind of go back through the summary. I always like audience participation, right? So I want, I'd like to teach back or have you guys teach me uh, kind of a little bit of maybe what you've learned today. So again, a stroke without looking at the screen, right? I already gave you all the answers probably up there, but a stroke is considered a brain attack. Um, can anybody tell me the warning signs, what be fast means? That mnemonic that we talked about, or at least give me the first B. Balance. Balance. Eyes, face, arm, face. speech, and time. Awesome, awesome, thank you, perfect. Like I said, if I walk out of here one, with one thing and I left you with one thing today, it's that be fast. It's just a really good quick mnemonic to, to kind of alert you and, and raise a red flag. Um, don't wait. Don't drive. Dial 911 immediately. Again, time is brain. How about the risk factors, six risk factors? And we'll do, we, do you, exercise, high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes. Yep. I Cholesterol, fat, blood pressure. Exactly. You guys nailed it again. Perfect. Perfect. Um, ABCs. It's out there. Or, or we, it, the, the jury's out right now, right? Still on the, uh, we're still deliberating on the A, but aspirin is one. And then, and then your other one would be blood pressure. Blood pressure. Yep. C, cholesterol, perfect. And S, lowercase, but S we also use to is our smoking, right? And then again, discovering your risk. If you, if you have any questions, I'm not gonna walk out of here real fast. So I'm happy to answer anything that you guys have. If, you, if you'd like more information on it, obviously I'm happy to give you more information other than the aspirin part right now. We'll just, I'll hold off on that. Um, but, you can always contact us at stroke at mymichigan.org. Is there anything? Preferably not. 911, and then we'll have computers in the room when you're there. We can go back through a risk assessment if you want. Yes. Is there a known uh, connection between hereditary or genetic kinds of issues for families? Do you see strokes run in families? That's a good question. So the question was actually, is there, and, and do you want me to repeat that question as well? We're good on there? Okay. All right. So there is, we, we have seen, uh, we have seen in, in familial lines that there is um, uh, risk of stroke, especially with high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Uh, we call hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol. Um, we do see patterns in in patients especially uh if a mother or a father um has had a previous stroke or tia we, we do at times see that that's why we always say working with your providers they may recommend a cholesterol medication they may recommend uh, diabetes type 2 diabetes we also see that that has some factors as well um so yes that's a good question but we do we do see uh we do see somewhat of a pattern there mm -hmm. yes Early on, you talked about the increase in strokes among younger people. Is there an explanation of why that's happening? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, again, a lot of the risk factors involve, but it has to do with uh, sedentary lifestyle. So um, kids not getting enough exercise, uh, diet specific. So not enough fruits and vegetables, more of a, of a high fast um, kind of a Fast food diets is, is what we'll leave that at. But like a higher fat content diet, uh, that can lead to stiffening of arteries a little bit quicker over time in younger generations. Uh, smoking is another one. Um, a lot of the same risk factors that we try to, when we when I do a lot of these, I like to kind of put that out there and, and, um, and kind of show you what the risk factors are right now that we can kind of curb. 
we need to start working a lot more with our younger generations or our, 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 our kids. I know it's sedentary lifestyle. Yep. Um, it's nothing wrong with a little bit of video games as long as you get some outside time too, right? Like we always want you to just, just stay active, stay as active as possible. Um, keep that blood pumping. When, when your heart's beating, it's washing the inner linings of those blood vessels and those arteries. You know, you're oxygenating your brain and, and more sedentary lifestyle can lead to uh, long-term um, long effects. When you're exercising, mm -hmm. uh, it would be advantageous to have your heart, heart beat for a minute up as much as you can make it. Ooh, when you're exercising, is it advantageous to try to have a maximum heart rate as you're exercising or about a maximum average? Nope, I wouldn't say that. And that'll, that can cause problems. That can cause problems. I would just say um, even just uh, intermediate exercises and stuff like that. If you go for a walk, you don't need to run at a full speed for an hour on a treadmill. Um, you don't, um, uh, you know, aerobic exercises, anything like that, that's just going to keep your body moving. It's going to keep the blood flowing, going to keep your heart pumping. We don't ever recommend, and, and um, I think that I can answer that correctly without somebody coming after me, but a high intensity workout five to six days a week is not recommended, but, but you know, just low intensity, um, some, some aerobics, a, a simple walk outside, that sort of thing is, is a I really good way. support the floor. Activity. You what? <laughs> the floor? Well, it's the lower activity. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, just here and there, three, four times a week, you know, three, four times a week. I mean, five times a week is good. I, I've, I've read studies before too, that say that, you know, it's highly discouraged that seven days a week of heavy intensity exercise or seven days a week of just hard exercises is, is not really recommended. An hour a day, very, very basic, good walk, that sort of thing is, is good to keep the body moving and the blood flowing. I was told that the important thing in mm -hmm. exercise, mm -hmm. even if it goes up high, like the gentleman said back here, mm -hmm. when you sit down, it comes back. It will over time, yeah. When you take a rest, don't, don't overexert yourself. And if you feel like you're reaching that point, obviously, your body, listen to your body. Your body's telling you to take a break, you know, sit down and, and take a break. Does dementia or Alzheimer's mm -hmm. not use? We do see with the dementia, Alzheimer's, there is, um, oh, um, the, the, there was a question asked regarding uh, correlation between dementia, and Alzheimer's, and stroke. Um, we do see that's one of the very difficult things to kind of pinpoint if there's a baseline of a patient that may have dementia or Alzheimer's, right? Um, really understanding, is that confusion new? Um, you know, if the patient presents and the family says, well, you know, they do have an underlying dementia and Alzheimer's, but what about that? Um, what about that confusion? Is there, is, are they seem more confused or not confused? There is a little bit um, of evidence out there that supports that there is dementia. There's a, um, a little bit higher risk for stroke in, in patients with dementia. Um, so yeah, yeah. Is that Does that answer? Mm -hmm. Well, you're prone to maybe more stroke. Um, so aging, the aging process. So the question again was, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. There mm -hmm. was an aging process. Mm -hmm. it's higher. Oof. The risk higher with the aging process or, you know, with dementia and stroke tied together. I would say not for, so the aging process with dementia. So dementia is more of a neurological, um, it's more, more of a neurological disease. Um, stroke is obviously, yes, your risk factors increase with stroke over time, just because as, as I was saying, your, your arteries stiffen, they lose their elasticity, your plaque builds up. Um, with dementia, a lot of times that's a familial um, it, it runs in like a family line. So like a, like you can see, you may see that more with a family that may have um, um, a family member that had previously had a dementia or, or Alzheimer's. But I don't think that there's any 
evidence out there that I'm aware of right now that specifies that aging um, just in an aging population causes that dementia. But yes, in an aging population, that does your risk factors in, increase for stroke. Does, does that kind of answer that question? All right. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, okay. This is really kind of a personal question because this um, past summer I was in the hospital due to I had had high blood pressure and electrolyte imbalance. But the first night I was there in the morning, I had a slight stroke on oh. my left side. Okay. I mean, a good place to be though. Sure. <laughs> but yeah. anyhow, what I'm wondering, and I did recover very quickly, I went to physical therapy, so forth, and I'm pretty much back to normal. But my question is, my left hand is extremely, well, it's sensitive to hot and cold, hot and cold water, or if I pick up something up, and it's, my hand is freezing a lot of the time. Okay. okay. And I'm wondering, is, you know, temperature-wise, is there, could there be some, something that happened in the brain that's causing that, or... It's it. So it is possible. Um, oftentimes, and Jan knows this probably well, she's probably spoke to this before, but a lot of times as we age, like I said, uh, your circulation tends to, to tends to decrease too. So that can cause, um, there's a, a syndrome, uh, uh, Ron, or, um, Raynaud's, Raynaud's, yes. So that can actually cause so, sometimes that tingling or that um, sensitivity to hot and cold. Um, now, hot and cold in the hot and cold for touch after a stroke, it's more a long lasting deficit for um, a motor function and skills uh, oh. that you would see after a stroke. Now, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds on it if, if that's okay. I was just going to say for um, when you were in, did they were they able to perform a, a head scan? They did a CAT mm -hmm. scan, and then they did an MRI. And an MRI. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. And did and they said that they found something. They did. I had had a stroke in two thousand six, which okay. was more serious, but I also recovered very well. Sure. But they could see that one, and mm -hmm. they could see that the, there was another one. Sure, yes. sure. Yeah, those the MRIs are very, they kind of hone right in on whether or not it happened within the last 24 hours or not. So we have the ability to utilize a couple different types of scans, which kind of will help us pinpoint a little bit better. Um, and it sounds like they did the appropriate workup, obviously, to 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 um, to identify. But yeah, one of the very first things after it's great that you know you rec or you had, had said that they got you started really quickly on with a uh, physical therapy yes. or occupational therapy. That's one of the big things right after a stroke. We want to make sure that obviously, if, if someone suffers a stroke, we want to get them right involved with physical therapy, uh, occupational therapy, and speech. Um, sometimes, if somebody's speech is slurred and it affects a certain part of the brain, we have to uh, we have to kind of focus our resources on those, those specific things. So that's, that's awesome to hear that. I mean, that you are improving and you're, you're, you're out here to see us today. Yeah. And I, yeah. I say are good things about treatment that I got and the care. Well, Everybody that, was fantastic. Well, that's, so, that's yeah. good to know. <laughs> that's good to know. Well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I use a leave, and I was wondering what you think about that. It's probably use it sometimes once in a day. Mm -hmm. So how would that relate to taking also aspirin? Because I don't do the aspirin. Sure. Again, that's one of those things I would, I, I don't want to answer that, only because of me not being a provider. I I don't want to overstep my boundaries. We kind of walk a thin line of our recommendations and stuff. Um, specifically for stroke, uh, aspirin is recommended, um, but I'm in a rock and a hard place here, Jan. <laughs> well, it's Aleve tough. does not yeah. do what aspirin does as far as yeah. preventing. Mm -hmm. Aleve doesn't work in that way. Aspirin right. kind of makes your platelets less sticky mm -hmm. so you're less likely to have that plaque that yellow thing that he explained yeah. and Aleve does not do that to my knowledge it helps yeah. with your other problems but uh, right not it can that. help with like your pain your you know pain tolerance or 
arthritis or if yeah, you there's have, nothing wrong with them. Nothing. Neither one of us would say there's something yeah. wrong with it, but you're taking it probably for a different reason right. than to decrease your risk of stroke. Again, I, I, I agree with Jameson. I'd talk it over with your doctor next time you go to the doctor and, and yeah. see what they say. So based off of their recommendations. Yeah. yeah. They, um, people do take them together. Mm -hmm. um, but depends on your reasoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At some point in the future, maybe I'll be at that point to where I can recommend those things, but not today. I can't do that yet. So, <laughs> all right. Any other questions? Or I don't know if there's anything. I I see Mark and Nancy on on with us too. I don't know if if they have any questions or not, or if they have a chat box that they can. I can put it in the chat, or I can speak. Oh. Okay. Speak. <laughs> um, 50 years ago, I had a cerebral hemorrhage. And I'm ever since then, of course, have been wary of, you know, making sure everything was okay. But I'm wondering if there's anything in newer research that says anything about that as a precursor for a stroke in old age. Okay, um, so a prior a prior hemorrhage, and you're wondering if that is a precursor currently uh, for a potential future stroke. Yeah. Okay, and and can I ask uh, again, not to get too personal? Was there um, was there any intervention on part of that hemorrhage, or did they? Oh yeah, uh, there was. Mm -hmm. I was in the hospital for a month and. Uh, had surgery and the whole nine yards. Sure, sure. Um, well, I appreciate you sharing that uh, with us. I would say that for hemorrhages specific, again, um, I keep going back to this and I know I probably sound like a broken record when I'm talking about it, but you know, the elasticity of our vessels over time, right? Um, when they lose that elasticity and we're not paying attention to our blood pressure, sometimes those, um, those ruptures can occur depending on where they're at in the brain. I would say that they are, obviously hemorrhages do fall under that category of stroke, but I'm sure that you follow up regularly with um, uh, a provider. Yes. Um, as long as you keep, you know, as long as they're paying good attention to your, your, your blood pressure, good blood pressure management, good cholesterol management, um, and they may, may or may not recommend with a history of um, hemorrhage, they may or may not recommend a thinner. Um, uh, typically they don't. I'm, but I would say that it doesn't put you at any higher risk for a, doesn't, it, again, I'm trying to use my words carefully here on that. Um, it, it shouldn't put you at any higher risk for a stroke in the future, but it is something that you should always keep on your radar that as long as you're following those recommendations by your provider, um, that, that would be your best bet at this point. I was that, told that 50 years ago, but I was just wondering mm -hmm. if anything had changed. Mm -hmm. It does. I mean, there, there are instances to where someone may have a hemorrhage and in the future they actually may return and they may have a TIA or a stroke, uh, be affected by a TIA or a stroke. So I don't want to rule it out and say completely off the table that no, um, it, it, it's anything is possible. Anything is possible. And obviously, again, going back to that with our, with our elasticity of our vessels over time and and, and losing that, it does put you at a higher risk for a repeat of a hemorrhage. And it also can put you at risk for a, a stroke as well. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. What are the numbers that are acceptable mm -hmm. for people that are 60 and older or mm -hmm. 70 and older or 80 and older, mm -hmm. as opposed to 120 being something like the standard? So I know the numbers are higher, much mm -hmm. higher. So, so I th the question was actually uh, with regards to blood pressure, right? Um, what is the acceptable standards for blood pressure uh, as we age? And I think it, it, I think it varies. Obviously, there's um, out right now about 130 over 90 is, is kind of what's considered an average for uh, younger individuals. But anywhere kind of 
anywhere within that. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, that's accurate. As long as as long as everything else again, and I, and I keep I'll keep going back to that provider. As long as your primary provider is okay with that, and they look at your lab work and everything looks acceptable, um, you know, 140s and 150s is not unheard of. Um, I mean, we at times and. Jane can probably attest to this. We see people sometimes with 220, and those are ones that you want to medically manage very quickly. And obviously, you don't send anybody out of a out of the hospital with a with a blood pressure at that rate. But um, you know, 130s, 140s, and 150s over you know 90, um, over 80. Um, those those sorts of blood pressures are 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 deemed acceptable. Um, again, blood vessels. Over time, elasticity, we lose it with aging. They tighten down, blood pressure goes up. Sometimes your primary provider will get you on a, uh, a blood pressure medication to, to mitigate the, uh, the highness of that. Going on a blood pressure medication as we get older is a little bit riskier. For one thing, it can work in excess and lower your blood pressure too much and cause falls. We're already at higher risk for falls as we age. And so sometimes they're not as concerned about a blood pressure that's a little higher because they're kind of afraid of the side effects of treating it and how that would happen. Because falling is a major catastrophe, as you all know, um, for anybody, but it happens much more often in seniors. We often educate to, you know, when you're rising out of bed, as Jan said, right when you get up in the morning, you know, sometimes your body will, will, will readjust itself, but standing up immediately when you get up, sometimes you'll get that lightheadedness, all right? And, and we call that actually orthostatic hypotension, which just means your blood pressure drops really suddenly and you almost feel faint, right? So well, not exactly on the stroke realm, but sort of close to the stroke realm, we always advise individuals to just rise slowly when you're getting out of bed. Nope, nope. I'm just saying that's uh, that's uh, a typical part of that that process. When we get up in the morning, that happens to me sometimes. You know, I'll throw my feet over the side of the bed and I'll go to stand up and I'll just be a little dizzy. Just your body, it's just a fluid balance in your body. And, and sometimes our, our blood pressure can drop if we stand up right away. So it's always good, hang the feet over, adjust to the surroundings and then stand up. All right, can anybody else? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity, like I said, to come and talk to you today. If you have any other questions or if you don't mind filling in that little packet, there's an eval form. Um, we'd, we wanna start doing more of these, but obviously we wanna know topics that are interest to you. Um, and so please let us know. We only get better with feedback. So thank you guys again. And online, thank you.